Do we understand the words that are coming out of our mouth? That is the question that we want to approach today. And maybe for some of you, that's not quite the way that you heard it when you were growing up. The question wasn't more so of, do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? It was actually a direct phrase to you, more like, you better watch your mouth. I can't tell you how many times growing up as a kid, the things that I would say and the, cho- the words that I chose, that my parents would immediately look to me, right? My dad, he wears glasses, and you know you're in trouble when you get the look that goes over the top of the glasses, right? Like, you know that it's not a good thing. And he would say, son, you better watch your mouth, you know what I mean? And I just knew that I had done something wrong. There suddenly was an impact. And what's crazy about that impact is that it actually happened after the words were already said. That sometimes we don't realize the power and the significance of our words until after they're already out of our mouth. Until they've already been put into the atmosphere. They've been said or spoke over somebody. And it's not just when we're kids. Let's be honest. It's, it's as we grow older as adults, right? I mean, let's just think about this for a moment. Like how many of you have ever been in that moment or you know somebody that just lost like total control of their mouth. Like in the heat of frustration or anger or disappointment or whatever. See, nobody wants to be honest in church. I love this, right? Like, I get it, right? Well, what about those moments where we have a phrase for it, right? It's like terminology where it's like open mouth and insert what? Foot. Like, you know this, right? Some of you are still not grabbing on what I'm putting down, right? Like, here's what I'm saying. Have you ever been in a situation where you actually ask a woman how far along she was or when she was due and she wasn't? Right? Like, I, you know, like, I mean, that happens at least once, right? You know what I mean? Some of you are above average, I was going to say, right? Because, because it's just like with your mouth, right? Just something happens with your mouth. Like, you can't control it. It's hard to explain. It's just the words that come out, they never come out quite right. And it just sounds a little crazy. But what's crazier than that to me is actually all the words that seemingly go out of our mouth that have potentially damaging effects that just ultimately go unnoticed, but yet carry significant influence in the lives of those that we love and the people that we hold most dear. Which is why over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about this idea of crazy talk. We're going to open up this series of discussions where we're actually processing the words that are actually coming out of our mouth. What they mean, why they're important. We're going to look at the context of it. We're going to look at what we say and why we say it. Because here's what you have to know if you don't get anything else out of this. Your words matter. The things that you say, it matters. Your your words have incredible influence. Your words have incredible impact. In fact, your words hold incredible power. And the implications of your words are huge. That with our mouth, we can either speak life or death or victory or defeat, insecurity or confidence, weakness or strength, trust or doubt. Or you can build someone up or you can totally destroy them. And the biggest problem that we have with our mouth, our mouths are so unpredictable. We're never quite sure what's actually going to come out or or, or if it's going to make sense or, or even if it's the most important moment. But here's what we do know about our words. Once they're out there, guess what? They're out there. (laughs) Once they're out there, they're out there. The good news is, is God has given us one of these. He's given us the ability to pause. He integrated a pause button in our life where we can, before we speak, we can pause before we speak. The problem is we miss the pause button because many of us are hoping for this button. We think that we can rewind what we said and suddenly go back to the way things used to be and everything's going to be okay, but that's just absolutely not true. Why? Because words, again, they're powerful, which means that you and I have been given an extraordinary amount of power. You and I are actually powerful people, believe it or not, because the things that we say hold power. In fact, if you're following along in your notes, and I hope that you will today because I think they'll be helpful to you as we kind of set up where we're going over the next few weeks, I just want to kind of talk about the influence of words. I want to talk about what Scripture says about words, and then we're going to take some next steps hopefully together. The first is this. Chances are, whether you've thought about it or not, but chances are good that our lives have been shaped by words that have been spoken. Our lives have been shaped by the words that have been spoken, to which you would say, I don't understand, the words that have been spoken, yeah. For instance, the words that have been spoken to us. 
Our lives, chances are, have been shaped by the words that have been spoken to us. The, sometimes it's, it's the mean and the, and the hurtful things that have been spoken to us. It's the stuff that, that kind of made us feel small. It's the stuff that kind of put us down. It's the stuff that, that was spoken to us maybe in anger or in disregard or just outright disrespect. For, for whatever reason, those words, they, they carried an impact in our life. For others, it was the words that people constantly spoke over to you, that, that, that you can do anything you want, and that the power is all in your hands, and, and they puffed you up, and they made you feel invincible until you got out into the real world, and you're like, you guys lied to me. Like, this is not how it works. Like, this is not the way it goes down. Like, this is harder than what I anticipated. But we're influenced by the words that are spoken to us. We're also influenced by the words that are spoken about us. Think about the words that have been spoken about you. Uh, the, all the, the things that have been kind of said maybe behind your back or, or kind of some of the, the perceptions that people have of you that apparently are never spoken directly to you but just kind of seem to be spoken around you and you never really fully know. You just hear bits and pieces of it, but it affects you. Maybe, maybe it's been like this for you where, where you were kind of, you remember being a student. You remember going to the parent-teacher conference and you sat in the parent-teacher conference as your teacher said all these things about you. Whether they were good or bad, I guarantee that some of those things that your teacher said about you still haunt you to this day. They're still with you to this day. You still think about them to this day. Why? Because words have incredible impact and influence. What about the words that have been spoken over us? The words that have been spoken over us. What do you mean by words spoken over us? I'm talking about isn't it true that it feels like most people have expectations of our lives? Expectations of the way we're supposed to, to, to live our life, the things that we're supposed to do, especially as it relates to family. Sometimes our family carries this, this expectation that you've got to live up to this. Why? Well, because it's our family name. You've got to live up to this. Your, your grandfather did this, and so your grandfather's grandfather did this, and so, so you too should follow suit in this. You don't want to fail the family. You don't want to be unsuccessful in, in, in your culture's eyes. And so, so what happens is there's this expectation that's, that's spoken over you. And sometimes it's not as pretty as we think. Sometimes it's like, well, I think you're good enough to do this, but I'm not so sure that you'll ever be good enough to do this. I think that maybe you can handle something like this, but, you know, in reality, I don't know that you'll ever be able to accomplish this. It's the words spoken to us, the words spoken about us, the words spoken over us that, that ultimately end up affecting us. Can, can you imagine the, the impact that this has in your life? Our whole outlook has been shaped by the words that we've heard. Our, our childhood was shaped by the words that we heard. Our, our relationships, our perspectives about who we are and what we do and what we think. Words have the ability to impact our confidence, our self-worth. I mean, think about someone with absolutely no confidence, with just a few people in their life sharing just a few words to them. They can be built up in confidence. Likewise, someone with all the confidence in the world that we aspire to be just like, all it takes is just a few strong words, and that person suddenly is absent. Absent of any, con, con, in any kind of confidence that they, they may have had before. Our words have power. The, the words that we say have power over our own lives, but the words that we speak also carry influence in the lives of other people. Not only do, do, do we are, are normally shaped by words that are spoken to us, about us, or over us, but, but have you ever thought about this concept as well? That, that, that our words carry a ton of weight in our lives. That depending on, on what was said and by whom it was said and where it was said and why it was said, that these words, they, they carry weight. But you know what's so interesting to me is that, that the weight, the weight just kind of easily fluctuates. Right? Like, like that the weight is, is, is never, never like just constant for all. It always seems to be a little bit different. Think about what was said. Now think about just the things that were said. When we talk about the things to you, about you, or over you, isn't it true that it's much easier for whatever reason to think about the negative things that have been talked about you than the positive thing that's been talked about you? And isn't it true that, that no matter what it is, if it's a negative thing, the negative thing takes at least like five or ten positive things to override the one negative thing? You ever thought about that? 
You ever thought about, like, like how many positive words does it actually take to, to kind of combat, like, the one negative word that you have just hold on to that has just kind of made such a deep imprint on your life? But not only what was said, have you ever thought about this? Who was it that said it? I mean, that carries weight, doesn't it? Who was it that actually, that actually said it? I mean, I mean, if it was like you're at work tomorrow, right, you walk in to work, and it's not like your boss. It's not like the head of the company, but it's like the guy like right under him, right, like not the actual boss, but the guy under him. Well, what if he comes to your office and says, hey, I need to talk to you about a little situation at work, right? We're cool about it. We're listening. We're all in, right? Why? Because his words are like 10 pounds, right? But, but if it's the boss boss, like, like the boss, like, 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 like not, not the guy under him, but the boss, if he comes into your office, suddenly he wants to talk about an issue going on at work. Now, now our job's in jeopardy. Now we think that everything's, now we're sweating, right? Like we're uncomfortable. Why? Because his words are a lot more like, like a hundred pounds, right? His words carry a lot more weight, I mean, any bosses or supervisors in the room, you, you would know that. But likewise, parents, you should know this as well. I mean, I'm fired up. I, I'm a pastor. I'm a parent, right? I'm a husband, and I'm passionate, right? Like, and I, I, I'll, I'll tell somebody, right, you know? And so sometimes it's with my kids. I want to go tell them, and who stops me? And my wife stops me and says, whoa, 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 whoa. How about I'll have that conversation? I'm like, what? Yeah, how about I have that conversation? What, what is she trying to say? She's understanding the weights of our words, and the significance of our words. She understands that her words has weight and value. Moms, you're in the room today. I want you to know your words, they have weight and they have value. You need to understand that. You need to understand your words have weight and value, and, and people hear what you say when you're speaking. But I also want to say this, men, husbands, fathers, fathers, I can't fully explain this, and I don't fully have the statistics to support it. I just have life experience and being in ministry and growing up in, a, in ministry for a long time. Fathers, listen to me. Your words weigh more than anybody. Your words are more heavy than anybody else's words. The words that you speak to your children, the words that you speak in your home, the words that you speak no matter where it is, you, it carries a huge amount of influence, a huge amount of weight. I saw it time and time again growing up. I had lots of friends that would hang out at my house, and my house was kind of like the, the center hub house, you know. My, my dad, he wasn't just a pastor in the community. He was the baseball coach in the community. You know, he was there for, for the kids, right? And, and most of my friends, they, they didn't have a dad at home, or their dad would come and go, or, or maybe they just had limited time with their dads. My dad would begin to speak life into them. My dad would encourage them. And know what was crazy to me? No matter what my dad would say to them, I always heard the back end as I was hanging out with them. They were like, wow, that was awesome what coach said. But I wish my dad would see that. I wish my dad would have said that about me. Why can't my dad see the same thing that, thanks, coach. Thank, thanks, pastor. Thanks, but, but, but why can't, I just want, it means something. We all have those people in our life that for whatever reason, their words, they just carry a ton of weight. They have a huge influence in our life. There's just no way around it. But, but what about this? How am I supposed to respond? How, how am I supposed to respond? In other words, I, I see this a lot when I'm dealing with couples, whether it be post-marriage or, 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 or pre-marriage, right? You're in relationships, and here's what happens. You have a blowout. You have an argument, right? Everything is going down, and, and, and you know, somebody said something, and it hurt somebody else, and then they said something, and it hurt somebody else, and somebody steps up and says, finally, okay, I get it. I said some things, like it was out of line, but I said that I'm sorry, I said that I'm sorry, I, I, I admitted it, you know, I, and I misspoke. That's not the way that I meant for it to come out, but that's just how it came out, and I'm sorry. To which you were thinking on the back end of that, I don't understand that how come because I said I'm sorry that we don't go back to the, thing, the way things were before I said the thing that actually hurt your feelings, right? How, how come just me saying sorry doesn't rewind all the way back and, and just, and just you know, kind of land us back at the spot where, like, we're good now, right? Like, I said I'm sorry, we're good, right? I can answer that question for you. It's for the same reason that if I came in carrying something heavy in my hands and I accidentally dropped it on your foot and broke your big toe, I can look at you in the eyes and say, I am so sorry, and my apology might be as sincere as can be, but that doesn't minimize the fact that guess what? Your toe is still broken. You are still unwhole. You are unhealthy, and we still got to go to urgent care. That's the reality of our words, right? The hurt is immediate, but the recovery, it takes time. 
In other words, forgiveness, forgiveness might be something that's given, but pain, pain isn't easily forgotten. When we we use our words to inflict hurt and when we use our words in unhealthy ways, guess what? That pain, it sticks with us and we have to wrestle through that. In fact, here's the way we can wrestle with it today. Let me ask you this question. Could it it be, could it be that your biggest relational regrets may have been simply avoided if you have just simply thought more about the words that you said? Could could some of your, your biggest blowouts Some of those relationships that you know you don't have anymore, some people that you were close to, that you're no longer close to, could those things have been avoided if if we just thought more about our words before we used them? Today, I want us to dive into God's word, this, 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 this incredible word that's filled with power and encouragement, this word that you and I, like we talked about over the last few weeks, have been given access to, that we can apply to our life, and it makes a difference in our life. I want to engage scripture because scripture has a lot to say about the words that we use. In fact, one of the guys that talks a lot about words is a guy named James, James who had a very popular brother. If you don't know who he was, his name is Jesus. This is James, the, the brother of Jesus. Okay, and he's writing this document known as the book of James or what's been come to known as the book of James. And so in this document, he's writing to the church, to first century followers of Jesus. And in this particular passage that we're going to read today, which is a bit longer than what we might normally read together, but I think it's so impactful as we start this discussion, is that James in James chapter three is talking to church leaders. He's talking to people who have influence, people who are in leadership, to which you would say, well, I don't know. Is that to exclude me? No, it doesn't exclude you. What James is going to talk to us about today and what we're going to discover is that these words apply to all of us. You know why? Because we all use words and we all have a mouth. I can see it on you. You can't hide it. It's there. We know this about ourselves. So as much as we want to say, well, well, you, you said he's talking to people of influence. Understand me up front. You have influence. You are a mother. You are a father. You are a husband. You are a wife. You are a teacher. You are a boss. You are a coworker. You are a friend. You are a BFF. You are whatever you want to call it. You have influence. Some influence might be greater than others, but Do not misunderstand what I'm saying. You, you've been given incredible influence, and what you do with that influence, it absolutely matters. It absolutely matters. So if you're following along your notes, James chapter 3, he starts out in verse, we're going to start out in verse 2 together. And I love this statement up front because it gives us all a chance to now breathe, okay? He says, indeed, guess what? We all make many mistakes, He doesn't leave anybody out. He just throws us all in the same batch and says, look, you need to know this about us as humanity, right? Like like we all make mistakes to which everybody gives a really good amen, right? Because we know that's us, right? Like like we we can agree with that. We've made mistakes. Some of you, let's just be real. You made mistakes with your words this morning. You made mistakes with your words on the way to church. I don't know who that applies to, but somebody needs to hear it because God's saying, hey, listen in. Lean in a little bit further because we've all been there, right? James says, indeed, we've all made many mistakes. But then he goes in and he presses in a little bit further with, with something that is interesting. He says, for if we could control our tongues, then we would be perfect and can also control ourselves in every other way. Now, that's a fascinating statement. <laughs> James, he, he says, we all make mistakes. But then he seems to kind of center in on the culprit behind the mistakes, He says that if you and I could actually gain some kind of control over our tongue, then guess what? That would be a good thing. In fact, if we could gain control over our tongue, then guess what? We would be able to to get control of a lot of other things as well. That maybe our tongue is responsible for some of the the cray-cray in our life. That, that, That maybe our tongue somehow is responsible. That James says if we gain control over our mouth, that would be perfect because if we gain control of our mouth, we could keep our whole body, our whole life out of trouble. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like trouble, right? Sometimes trouble seems to find us, but sometimes we have no problem just getting ourselves into a lot of trouble. And chances are it comes by the things that we say, the things in our mouth. So he provides us some examples. He says, we can make a large horse go wherever we want it to by the means of a small bit in its mouth. 
that's fascinating, right? You think of these big, giant animals, right? These strong, majestic creatures. Some of you, you're animal people. Like, you love horses. I'm going to tell you, I don't. Right? Like horses freak me out, right? I, I had a friend growing up who, who had uh, several horses, horses that were still trying to be kind of broke, you know, and, and, and be rideable. And I went to go see them one day at his house, and they were kind of in this big metal pen hanging around in this rink area. And I went and I got up there and I was like, wow, these horses are beautiful. And this horse started moving a little bit, and I don't know if he got anxious or whatever, but he kind of started running around the rink a little bit. And then he got real close to where I was and kind of bumped it with his hip, you know what I mean? To where I like, I backed up and I'm like, I don't like horses, man. I don't, I don't like horses. You know what I'm saying? I'm done. Like, I, that's all it takes. Like, I don't like, I don't like horses, right? And let's just be real. No matter how pretty they are, when they look at you, they look crazy. You know what I'm saying? Like, got the big nostrils coming at you. Like, it's crazy, right? But he, but, but James says, you, you take all that craziness, right? You, you, you take all that power. You, you take all that strength, and, and he says, here's what happens. You just place this small, this small piece of metal into their mouth, and guess what? Now you can control the entire animal. If you can control its mouth, you can control the entire animal animal but he goes on he says and and it's like this it's like a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go even though even though the winds are strong even though it's high seas even though it's choppy on the water the reality is you have a huge ship and it's not the the monstrosity of the ship that makes the difference it's the small tiny rudder that makes all the impact in other words, James says, picture it, okay? This would be like this first century kind of merchant, like Roman merchant ship, okay? This is what he might have had in mind when he was talking to people about this. This is at the very least what they might have imagined in their day and age. But no matter how big the ship is, no matter how big the sails are, no matter how high the mast stands, he says the reality is it all boils down to this guy right here, the rudder. It's the rudder that controls it where to go. Even when things are crazy, even when the winds are high, even when the sea is choppy, it's the rudder that begins to influence the whole thing. What is he saying about our tongue? He's saying as it relates to the rest of your body, you got to understand the tongue is disproportionate to the rest of who you are. But this small thing carries incredibly huge impact. It's not the strongest muscle in your body, but it could cause the most devastation it's not the strongest muscle in your body, but it definitely dictate, dictates direction and destination. You have to understand this about your tongue. He says, don't miss the size of what's going on here. He continues to lean in. He says, in the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. Okay? Another translation says, makes great boasts. Right? Some of you know it like, talks a lot of trash. Right? Like, like, like makes promises that it can't keep. You know? Like, like you got a long list of like, you, you know what this is like, right? Like, the, like the, the mouth says all kinds of things, but actually follow through. Well, that's a whole other thing, right? You know, it's like we, we can say whatever we want. And we think that's true of us, that we can say whatever we want. And there's zero to minimal implications. And James says, no, no, no. I'm going to set something up for you. That's absolutely wrong thinking. He says, you have this, this tongue that's sm a small thing, and it makes these, these grand boasts. But he says, don't miss this. Don't, don't miss the significance of your tongue. In fact, I had to do some tongue research, you know, knowing we're talking about the tongue this week. And when you do some tongue research, you know what you discover? You dis discover that the human tongue, on average, weighs about two to two and a half pounds. Hey, hey, I don't know if you knew that, right? Like, have you ever tried, uh, tried to weigh it? You know, it's like... You know, it, in your mouth, you, you, have, you have a two to two and a half pound tongue, and it's about three to four inches long, roughly. It's comprised of eight muscles, not one muscle, but eight different muscles comprises your tongue. And these muscles, get this, they never wear out and they never get tired. <laughs> to which the fellows are like, oh, believe me, I know. I, 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 I mean, and you're not going to look at her. You're just going to keep looking straight. I see you right now. He's like, don't, don't even look, right? Because you know, right? Like, like the tongue, just, it just never gets tired, right? Like the, like the little kids, right? You're just like, where did you get all that energy? Can you just, okay, quiet game. Quiet, let's just play the quiet game. How do you think? Because the tongue, it never stops, right? It just keeps on going. That's, that's the power of the tongue. In other words, what James is saying, at the very least, you and I have been given two pounds of power. 
Think about it. Two pounds of power have been given to you and I. And what you do with that kind of power, oh, man, it, it, means, it means everything. Why? Well, he says, let me set this up for you. Because understand this about the power in your mouth. He says, a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, know this about the tongue. The tongue is a flame of fire. The tongue is a flame of fire. In other words, he says, you see this? This is like your tongue, right? That You can never get it to light, you know, usually, but there it is. This is like your tongue. You were born with your pilot light on. You were born lit. Right? Your tongue was already on fire. Your, your tongue is just naturally like this. Do what you're like. Well, that, that's a cool thing, right? right? Yeah, yeah, he says, but the tongue is a flame of fire. But the problem with your tongue being a flame of fire is you have to be careful what you do with that flame of fire. He goes on, he says, it's a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. You can set your whole life on fire, for it's set on fire by hell itself. Whoa, that's a mouthful, James. I don't understand. He says, yeah, he says, that little tiny flame, that little tiny spark, that little tiny flicker. He says, you got to be careful what you do with that spark and what you do with that flicker. Why? Because your tongue is deceitful. Your, your tongue is actually corrupted. Right? Your tongue is so unpredictable. And if you're not careful, here's what happens. You can set your whole life on fire. What started out as just this little tiny flame, what just started out as something so small, has now turned in to something really major. And you and I, listen, we don't have to imagine this. We live in California. We know about the California wildfires, right? Like we, we understand what this looks like. We can turn on our TV. Chances are there's somebody in the room that knows someone that's been affected by fires in California. You've seen this happen. You know about the warnings that you can't do certain things in California. Why? Because it's so dry. We don't have enough rain. There's all these things that we just can't do because we don't want to end up like this. Sometimes we don't think of this in terms of our words and what's coming out of our mouth. We think that we can just spark something here. We can just shoot a fiery dart here. We can just say this little thing over here. We can push somebody's button over here, and it's harmless. It's, just, it's, it's, it's fine. But the reality is, James says, it's not harmless. You know why it's not harmless? Because many of us, although we don't have to imagine this, most of us, even though we've not been affected by a fire like that, most of us sit in the desolation of the fire. Most of us know the destruction that's caused by the fire. In other words, the destruction that's been caused by our words. The destruction that's been caused by, by this simple little spark. That, that, that we've been left devastated. That, 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 our, that our words have somehow, like James says, corrupted our entire body. How do you say that? It's corrupted our entire marriage. It's corrupted our entire relationship. It's corrupted our entire job. It's corrupted our friendships. It's corrupted all this stuff in our life, and we're left sitting just in, in the loss. We're left sitting in the destruction. We're left sitting overwhelmed, not knowing what to do. And James says, I'm calling your attention to this. You should know this. You should understand this. This makes perfect sense. That little spark is significant because it does affect all that you are. To which you're like, yeah, I'm trying to get there. Listen, parents, you're in the room. You know this, right? If your kid is in trouble, you don't put their mouth on timeout. You put the whole kid, right? Right, because it's the whole kid that's the problem, right? Not like the mouth might have started, but you put the whole kid on timeout. Likewise, like, like bosses, you know, supervisors, you know, like, like you, you, don't, you don't fire a mouth, right? Like you fire the whole person, don't you? Like, like you, you don't divorce a mouth. Chances are you divorce the whole person. Why? Because it's the mouth that starts the corruption that ultimately affects the entire body. The fire breaks out, and then you're left with nothing less than sitting in the ashes. Defeat. Frustration. Be being overwhelmed. In, in, fact, in fact, James takes it a step further, and he says, you know what? If we're not careful, the enemy will actually infiltrate our words. And not only will the enemy cause destruction, and not only will the enemy cause you to feel devalued and others around you to feel devalued. But here's what I think is most dangerous. The enemy will use your words to cause division. He'll use your words to cause division. He'll create strife between you and other people. 
who create division between family members, who create division between husbands and wives, who create division within his church. Not only that, but you know what's even more worse about that is that not only will he create division using your words, the the fire that you spit out, he'll use it not only to create division between you and others, but he'll use it to create division between you and God. You and God. We become less and less like our heavenly father. We become more and more embittered and enraged and angered. And we allow this spark to fully consume who we are, becoming nothing like Jesus intended us to be. James says there's there's huge implications to all this, to which some of us would push back and say, okay, okay, I get it, James, okay. Okay, that's good. Like, I I think I understand. Like, like, this is intense, you know what I mean? I'm good. And James says, no, I want you to get this. I really want you to get this. So he leans in a little further and he says, look, people can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish. Right? We know that to be true. Animals can be subdued. Right? Nobody woke up this morning in fear of, like, the animal kingdom. Like, nobody woke up in fear of, like, wildlife coming into your... No, no, we we, we can subdue the animals, right? All kinds of animals can be tamed. But listen to this next statement that kind of throws us for a loop. But James says, but no one can tame the tongue. No one can tame the tongue. It's It's restless and evil and full of deadly poison. He's like, for real, like, this thing should have came with, like, a warning label. Like, they, they, you should have known the day you were born. Like, there's something up with this tongue in your mouth that carries huge impact in the world around you. He says, and no one can tame it, which doesn't leave us a lot of hope, right? It doesn't make us feel good. You're like, like James, like, like well, I don't understand what you mean by, by we can't tame the tongue. You, there, there's got to be a way. And then James begins to kind of just lean into a paradox that we find in our lives a lot of times. Maybe you've been there. Sometimes, sometimes our mouth does this. It praises our Lord and Father. And sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. Talk about speaking out of both sides of your mouth, which we know is super awkward and like, why would you want to be around anybody that does that? But James says, let's be honest. This is what we know about our mouth. This is what we know about our words. That there are moments that we'll be here on Sunday, we're like, woo, God is good. I'm so overwhelmed by your love, Jesus. Yeah. And then we walk out, you're like, did you see her? (laughs) Like, for real, for real? Like, she's going to come in here and be, you know, or he's going to do, he's, you hear what he said? And then we, we, we begin to get frustrated. We begin to talk about, we begin to unleash words. And here's what we know. Even if those words aren't spoken directly to them, those words that we are releasing have still destruction and devastation along with them. Why? Because we're destroying ourselves because James says, like, why, why are we setting the double standard? He says, and so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. And then he says, listen, guys, surely, brothers and sisters, you know this, right? That's not good. That's not good. To which everybody that's reading this or everybody that's listening in as it's read aloud within community are sitting there and they're thinking through it. And James, again, presses in and says, let me, let me give you an example so, so you know, like, like this, this just doesn't work. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Like, like if you had a fresh water spring, right? If you went to the store and you bought your bottle of water and it says, like, spring fresh arrowhead and you opened it up and it's bitter, wouldn't you be frustrated? You're like, how does that work? How does it come from a fresh spring, but it's got this bitter taste to it? That doesn't make any kind of sense. James says, "Mm mm-hmm. Like, now you're experiencing it because you experienced this in your life. You know this to be true. And he goes on, he says, does a fig tree, this is just funny now, does a fig tree produce olives? James says, now that you're all listening to me, let's just kind of like, you know, let's give you the obvious answer. Does a fig tree produce olives or does a grapevine produce figs? No, no. Does an orange tree produce apples? No. Does a grapevine produce oranges? No. We can go on and on. He's comparing and contrasting this great paradox of like praises and cursing shouldn't be coming out of the same mouth. There's a problem with that. And if we know that to be true of us, James would then say, we know that that's something true of us, so we've got to do something about it. But here's what's fascinating. James says that, that you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. This is, this is how he kind of fixes it. He says, you know, figs don't produce olives and grapevines don't produce figs. No, we know that. But here's what you have to understand. You can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. Here's what I want to challenge you to think about today. How many of you in the room today are just a little salty? You came in today a little salty towards someone. 
you came in a little salty about a situation. You, you came in a, a little salty over whatever the circumstance was. And yet you want to praise God, you want to lift your hands, and you know that that's what you want to do. But at the same time, you know the conflict and the contrast that's going on in your life. You want to lift your hands, but he says, hey, how can you experience fresh water if you're just going to be, remain embittered? If you're going to remain angered? If you're going to remain frustrated? If you're not going to give that thing over to God? If you're just going to sit there, to which we say, okay, James, thank you for this great understanding. I appreciate you making us all feel better about ourselves. So now, now, can you tell us how to fix it? Now, James, can you give us like three or five or seven things of next steps on how to fix it? To which this is what I contend with when I read this passage of Scripture that is so fascinating but yet frustrating and challenging at the same time. This is how James ends it. James says, fresh water from a salty spring, that doesn't happen. Mic drop and walks off and starts talking about something else. Like, like read it. Like, like, like just, he, J, James, he just, he just kind of stops right there and he turns and starts talking about wisdom, which also wisdom has a part to play in our speech, absolutely. But James, James just says like, hey, hey, know this. You can't draw fresh water from a salty spring, the end. And you're like, that's messed up, James. That, that's messed up because because what am I supposed to do with this? Like like what what am I what is my what is my next step? And I think that's James's point. James is like, hey guys, when it comes to your crazy talk, when it comes to your mouth, I don't want you automatically thinking like, well, here's just the one or two things that I got to do, and it's all good. Here, here's just the the the, the kind of take two of these and call me in the morning, and like it's all going to be fine. No, James wants us to know that this is a problem, and to fix the problem is going to take an ongoing process. It's going to take an ongoing, everyday awareness and mindfulness of the words that we're saying, the things that we're speaking, and who we're communicating with, and how that sounds. He says, you guys have to sit in this, and we have to understand this and know this, to which we all sit back and we scratch our heads and say, yeah, okay, but what do we do if we don't know what to do? And here's my temptation today. i got to be honest with you. My temptation is to be like, well, so what do we do when we don't know what to do? Yeah, I don't know. See you next week. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, like maybe we'll, we'll figure it out then. Oh, we're still going to talk about it next week. We're going to continue to dig in o- over the next few weeks. But, but, but here, here's the reality. We, we can't just walk out of here just, just wrestling with our tongue and our words. I mean, there's got to be some kind of next step that we can take. So I want to talk about just three simple steps. And maybe for some of you, it's just taking one step. But, but at least three ideas that, hear me when I say this, they're ongoing ideas. Right? These aren't just like one and done ideas. They're, they're ongoing. They're things that have to continuously be done and revisited if we're going to be aware of the way that we talk. So I want you to lean into this because I think this, this part is, is so, so incredibly important. The first is you, you have to remember your words. They have incredible power. I know we've been talking about it, but seldom do you and I actually realize it. I bet you there's some people in the room today, and you're thinking, nobody listens to me anyway. Listen to me. They listen to you. Even when you think that you aren't heard, the words that you speak, they carry power. You need to remind yourself your words have incredible power. Listen to me. Moms, moms, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, your, your words have incredible power. Dads. Dad's in the room, husband's in the room, men in the room. Listen to my words. You have incredible power in here. The words that you speak, the things that you say. What am I talking about? The way that you honor your wife. The way that you speak to your daughters. The way that you speak to the people that you work with, the women that you work with. Why is he focusing just on women? Because isn't it true of us men that sometimes we think that we don't have to give them the same respect as other guys? We got to be true in church. Let's just be real. This is a transparent moment. And it's not just to the men. Men, understand and know your words have weight. Your words have value. Your words are heavy. But women in the room, wives in the room, you need to understand that your words have power too. You need to understand that, that some guys, here, here's what we won't tell you. You know, on the outside, we look like we got it all together. On the outside, we try to be big, bad, and tough, and strong, and all that. But you know what? On the inside, our egos are incredibly fragile. We're so overwhelmed by the weight of everything that we feel is on us that it's hard to deal with sometimes. And your words, they make a difference in our life. Your words carry weight. Your words carry power in our life. Married, unmarried, it doesn't matter. 
Students, I'm glad you're with us this weekend. This message is for all of us. Students, you need to understand that the things that you say to your parents, the words that you speak to your parents, it matters. The things that you say, you sit back and you think, well, I'll just say whatever I want. It's just my, it's just my lame parents anyway. Listen, there's no such thing as lame parents. Parents have been given to you by God to watch over you, to do their very best to steward you. And yeah, we make mistakes and yeah, we mess up. But the things that you say to us, guess what? It carries a significant weight. It hits hard. And you need to know that. What does scripture tell us to do with our words? Whether it be our wives, whether it be the women in our lives, whether it be parents, whether, whether it be, be men, whatever, to, to honor others with our words. You get to make that choice today by recognizing that your words have incredible power. So why not use your words to honor one another? To build up others, to encourage one another. Second thing is this. Proverbs 18, 21 says, the tongue, it can bring death or life, and those who love to talk will reap its consequences. You have to know that we have the opportunity, a choice within us to take responsibility for the power given to us, to be able to utilize it in a way that brings life or that brings death. But either way we choose, know this, the consequences will be experienced. Know that the consequences will be experienced. You have to choose to know that your words have power. And then you surrender. God, help me to be mindful of the way that I speak. Help me to be mindful of the way that I speak. Some of you have heard it this way. Think before you speak. We wish we could, right? Sometimes we don't. Most of the time we don't. But if we are surrendering ourselves to God, God, would you help me to be mindful of my words? Help me to be mindful of the things that I say. Help me to be mindful of how it sounds to other people. Sometimes we can't hear ourselves talk. We can't hear how it sounds to somebody else. But if we're surrendering our talk to God and say, God, God, would you do something in me that helps me? God, God, in fact, would you guard me? Guard the things that I say. Proverbs 13, 3. Those who guard their lips, guess what happens? They preserve their lives. But those who speak rashly come to ruin. We don't have to live in the ruins. We don't have to stay stuck in the, in the devastation. But it requires, understand this, not a one-time surrender, but a daily surrender. A daily surrender to God. God, be a guard over my mouth. God, would you guide my words? In fact, I challenge you to pray this this week. God, I surrender my mouth to you. God, would you use my words to speak life? God, would you use my words to encourage? God, I give my words over to you. I surrender my words to you. And then we confess. We need to confess. What am I saying? Don't don't just justify or excuse, but instead... Own the fires that you start. Yeah, but you said if I just say I'm sorry, it doesn't automatically take us back to where we were before. Yeah, that's right. Remember, the hurt is immediate, right? But but that healing and that response, that, that, that takes some time. But at least by you confessing and owning the fires that you start, instead of trying to excuse them or explain them away, that actually begins the process. And the longer you try to excuse it away and pretend like it's not a big deal and it doesn't really matter that much, the bigger the fire is becoming. You can't see it. Chances are you only experience it as you sit in the destruction of it. So why not just own the fires that you start? And let's just be honest. Even if you accidentally start a fire, you're still responsible for that fire. Even if it's by accident. Own it. Accept it. Why? Because words are powerful. Matthew 12, 36. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word that they've spoken. For every empty word that we just said, ah, it doesn't matter. Ah, it's not that big of a deal. Ah, whatever. I mean, that's deep because you're just like, wow, you brought up like judgment day. Are you going to go there on, on week one, Pastor Jack? Like for real? I thought you said you want me to come back for the next few weeks. Here's what I'm trying to say. God doesn't take our words lightly. God has entrusted us with an incredible power. And what you do with that power matters. 
you're held accountable for that. And it's nothing to make you fearful. It's, it's nothing to make you, you know, live afraid. It's simply to be mindful that I daily confess to God, 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 I'm confessing to you that I don't always get it right. And yeah, like James says, sometimes I make mistakes, but God, I want you to help me to be better. And so God, God, I choose to own the fires that I started. And not just own the fires that I started, but I choose to do something about it. See, chances are some of those fires that are burning so bright right now are with those that are closest to you, those that you love the most, those that you, you wish things would be better, but they're just not. But you have an opportunity to do something about it. You have a responsibility, and as your words go, so goes your life. So goes your marriage. So goes your parenting. So goes your career. So goes everything in your life. Choose wisely, James is telling us. In fact, the one way you can say it is if you want to actually take a step towards changing the direction. If our words are all about direction and destination, if you want to actually change the direction of your life, then simply allow God to change the way you talk. Allow God to change the way you talk. How? How You said it's, it's untamable. No, it might not be able to be tamed, but it can be guarded. By remembering your words have power. By surrendering your words to God. By confessing and owning those fires that you start and taking a next step to do something about it. As the worship team comes back out to continue to worship with us today, I just want you to take this challenge for a second. I want you to think about this. And this, again, it applies to, to all of us. Would you take me up on this offer today or even in the next day? Maybe even throughout your week. Would you just pause and reflect on the things that you've said? In fact, would you take an inventory of the last 48 hours? Just try this later on today. Take an inventory of the last 48 hours and ask yourself, is there anyone who, who may still be suffering the pain of your words? Is there anyone who still might be suffering from the hurt and the damage of some misplaced words, some words that didn't come out right, some words that were spoken in the heat of the moment, some words that, man, you wish you could take back, but now that they're out there, they're out there. Would you pray and ask God to give you strength to have a conversation, to have the apology made? Would you allow God to begin the restoration process in your life so that he can help us with the words that we say sounding less and less crazy. Let's pray. God, thank you.